Music is adored by people around the world and is one of humanity's greatest achievements. But why exactly do people love it so much? Can science explain how that works? This question and a lot more coming up on Beyond Belief. Please welcome to the show, Dr. Stefan Alexander. Doctor, it is great to have you here. Thank you so much for being on the program. I, uh, you, oh, it's my pleasure. Um, and I'm really looking forward to getting into both the musical world and the world of science with you. And just to start things off, I, I watched your TED Talk, which I really enjoyed. And there was, there was one thing that you said there that really struck me as different um, where you, you said sometimes to get to the answer, you need to be irrational. And my understanding of science, and please correct me if I'm wrong, um, is that science is all about rationality. So what, what do you mean when you say that sometimes to get to the right answers, you have to actually abandon your rationality? Yeah. I mean, and if, I remember when I gave that TED talk, I was unaware of an Albert Einstein quote. Um, he was asked, I believe, in the 30s at the Oxford University, how did you come up with the theory of relativity? I think it was a theory of general relativity. Um, and he said, it's because of the free invention of the human intellect. Um, and again, I think he was also pointing to this, this sort of irrational, maybe jumps. Um, um, and, and so, yes, I would say that there are elements of science that have rationality in it. I mean, certainly in physics, you know, we use mathematics as a tool and a lot of math has, you know, it's about rational thinking or discursive thinking. Um, here's this, here's a set of rules, apply these rules, stick to these rules and, and, you know, try to make progress with these um, rules. But I was also talking about the process of discovery and the process of um, creativity in the sciences. So there is learning science and sometimes the end product of, and the use of in learning science and um, learning physics um, has a lot of that kind of math and a lot of structure and a lot of technique, but doing science and doing physics in this case, doing it, um, engaging in research, trying to discover new things um, does involve um, sometimes irrational thinking, sometimes intuitive leaps. Um, so that's kind of where I was coming from with that. Okay. And would you say that there's a connection between that kind of thinking and, and musical thinking? Big time in my experience. Okay. Um, so is music less rational than science? Ooh, I mean, at this stage, I, I mean, right now at my, this stage with music, um, in my practice, because, you know, I, I'm still a student of music. Um, Me too. Yes. <laughs> 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 um, um, that I feel these days, the things I'm working on are very rational things. I'm like working on, you know, just the usual stuff, right? Like trying to um, understand how to play through certain types of chord changes. And there are certain rules um, having to do with that. And really de devoting that to memory and to my fingers and to my technique so that I can be a better improviser. Um, they, they, I think it's, I think I found, I've discovered that it's equal, actually. My experience, um, I'm talking now as a jazz musician, there's just as much rationality and irrationality in my musical practice as there is in physics. Wow, that's actually exciting for me to hear. And I, I think a well, lot I of people would be win like that, but that's interesting. <laughs> I, think, I think people would be surprised to hear that physics has any aspect of irrationality. Um, but that's, that's enticing um, on many levels. And um, let me pivot for a second to, to music itself. Um, there's a musicologist that I just love. Um, his name is Victor Zucker candle. And um, he said the following thing. I love that last uh, name. <laughs> it's a great, it's a great name. Yeah. And um, he wrote a very deep book um, about the nature of music. And it stuck with me for a while now. And uh, let me just read you a quote that he says and get your reflection on it. But he says, how can tones have meaning? 
Words have meaning because they relate to things. Sentences because they express something about things. Tones do not relate to things, do not express anything about things, represent nothing, betoken nothing, indicate nothing. What is it then that is meaningful in tones that allows us to distinguish sense from nonsense in, a, in successions of tones? So this is something I've wondered about for a really long time. Like, why do people love music? What is it about the, the megahertz and the vibrations in the air, which can be expressed mathematically, but then when they hit you and you experience them are so powerful? My question to you as a scientist and a musician is, can science explain why people love music? I think in part, yes, and in part, no. Um, I think um, research has already established that somehow, you know, the human brain and um, so sound perception engages much of the human brain, and I think uh, from you know we can fact check this um, just as much maybe as the brain as the visual cortex, but I think maybe more that like you know our brain uh, is engaged, the different parts of our brain is engaged fully to perceive sound. To tap that, so even at the level of neuroscience, the other thing that's also interesting is that you know the tones that are known to be important and pleasing, um, you know. Carol Kromanskill at Cornell established like um, experimentally um, that basically the human mind is equipped to basically um, establish hierarchies in like the major triad, for example. So hmm. there's, there's research already suggesting that like there will be there we're moving in this direction to actually understand that. But at a deeper level, um, you know, as you were saying this, I was thinking about one of the first songs to learn how to play, and it there's something about the 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 movement. I'll, can I sing it? Can I sing the, the tone? Sure. Please. Da, 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 da. I mean, oh. that is a universal movement, right? Um, it's minor. It has a kind of ancient feeling to it. And in, when I first heard it, um, I had to learn how to play that song in third grade. Um, is that Havana Gila? That's Havana Gila. I was in third grade in the Bronx, and it says Janoff taught us to play the sing the song. And um, again, I remember it evoked this sort of feeling in me, right? And there's something about, oh, 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 you know, I mean, what's up with that? I mean, that's kind of, <laughs> like there's some ancient, something ancient about some of these, these the minor and the major and all these things that that's kind of like, like like an ancient like an ancient memory, you know. That's just interesting to me. Yes, and I guess I would. Modes. I'd be inclined to ask you how those ancient memories are embedded in us. One and two is, even if they are, so what? You know, why should it speak to me? Like, why? Why don't I just relate to it's like you know, like when I drop a bunch of nails on the counter, you know, like that's some tones also. That's also some vibrations of the air, yes. but doesn't do very much for me. There's no. there's <clears throat> there's something about the structure. Uh, the sequence of the tones um, that seem to penetrate in a way that's inexplicable is the yes. best way I could I could say it. Yeah, and that and seems I think to my to my friends that study this who are like you know they study the neuroscience of music. It's like a, it's a research topic for these people. They don't un, for, they don't understand this is a this is a scientific research question you're actually asking. And another thing that's interesting that let to add to some texture to what you're saying, you know, it's like if I. Um, if I, I was going to pick my sax up and play the modes for you, um, I don't mind you, if you don't, I mean, I can do that. Um, um, <laughs> is it I nearby? It's an nearby. Is it close to you? It's close to me. Yeah, um, please. Because I think this is actually, this is where to me, a very interesting research question. And, um, I, I get, you'll be able to pause this thing and, and so, um, so for example, um, just a very simple thing, right? Everyone knows. Everyone knows um, that the major scale, though, uh, there. Right. So, but I've played. All 
right. So what's amazing about that is that I, if I just literally play C major and I just, instead of starting at C, I just start with D and play exactly the same notes. And I do this. I get the minor scale, and it's, it's already built in. And if I go up again, all the modes, all the minors and the majors and you know the Lydia and all that stuff is built in. This is the right already in that major scale. Somehow our brain can is able to know that. I find that to be completely fascinating. So do I. And I just want to remind our audience that this is actually a professor of physics at a major university who can also blow through changes on his horn. And how how often do you see that? But um, I'm trying. Um, <laughs> let, let me ask you a question from your book. <clears throat> I just want to give that a little plug. This is called The Jazz of Physics. You got to read it. It's a fantastic book. Um, you talk about the concept, a very old concept called the music of the spheres. And you explain that in the history of science that they were actually scientific thinkers who thought in terms of music to explain planetary motion and other matters. Could you explain what that is and what the implications are on the on the emerging of, of physics and music? Yes. You know, um, I think the more general theme I was trying to get at is that it's really um, important for the advancement of science um, and the humanities, actually, to try to explore places where different disciplines that are traditionally not thought to be connected, I mean, sociologically and psychologically, to try to do that. So, you know, in my case, I had the dual life as um, a, a student of music, playing in the jazz clubs at night, and and being a, and being a, trying to become a professional scientist. And these worlds, I, w I was taught to not have these worlds merge, um, and I, out of necessity, had to do it. And I wrote that book as a result of it. To only discover in writing the book that this was an age-old thing, and um, I didn't know this. That I wish it, would, it was taught to me in school that at the very birth of like, you know, Western science um, was this impulse to you know, the music of the spheres, the Pythagorean school, which influenced Plato and Socrates and all of those people, leading to Kepler, which used musical, musical analysis to discover, you know, the, the Kepler's laws of planetary motion. So yeah, I think it's, it's um, these days it's even more necessary for us to find ways to look at the ways that different disciplines should over could overlap. Um, even if they don't fundamentally overlap, the exercise of doing that, I think, can help us break new boundary, break boundaries, basically. So it seems like that impulse um, to ascribe vibrational concepts to to the universe has continued into modern times, and obviously, we you know, where people are familiar with the concepts uh, known as string theory. And um, I just I came across. Um, a quote from one of your colleagues, Michio Kaku, um, who said the following. He said, the subatomic particles we see in nature, the quarks, the electrons, are nothing but musical notes on a tiny vibrating string. Physics is nothing but the laws of harmony that you can write on vibrating strings. The universe is a symphony of vibrating strings. So now, is he being poetic here? Um, or should we take this literally that that somehow undergirding the entire structure of the universe is is this this music, this this vibration? Um, you know, because I know a little bit of string theory, um, I would I would have to agree with him, actually. I mean, I used to think it was just poetic, but, you know, the one theory that we do have, whether the theory is correct or not, in terms of the program that we have that started with Albert Einstein, which is let's look at 
the laws of nature through principles and through symmetry principles, the best theory known to us is string theory. And it does have that structure. It is a theory of vibrating strings and basically um, vibrating one dimensional objects. And in a sense, musical, musical instru a lot of musical in instruments, the ones that generate tone are based on vibrating string like entities, including like wind instruments, right? Except that it's more of a tubular vibration um, within uh -huh. the instrument. But yeah, I mean, um, I do think that there's some, tr some truth to it. It's very compelling that, um, that the universe is an expression of um, sort of like um, res no, different sort of uh, composite resonance of, of vibrating fields or strings. Um, and in a lot of ways, that's kind of what I was getting to in, in my book. Although I was a little bit more democratic and even how I, you know, going back to what you were saying, that this, the difference between musical vibrations and non-musical vibrations, exploring that as well. Yes. So I don't know how familiar you are with this, um, but I, I was reading, you know, trying to learn up. Uh, first of all, trying to learn string theory is, uh, you know, without a real background is is tough uh, you know for for a lay person it is um very hard to wrap your head around exactly what it's getting at mm -hmm. nonetheless mm -hmm. from a from a theological perspective let's say mm -hmm. i don't know if you've been exposed to ideas in kabbalah for instance but um as i was reading uh, i'll read you something else it says this it says string theories require extra dimensions of space-time for their mathematical consistency. In something called bosonic string theory, space-time is 26-dimensional, while mm -hmm. in superstring theory, it's 10-dimensional, and in M theory, it's 11-dimensional. Mm -hmm. So if you, have, if you have learned some of the basics of Kabbalah, which I'm not saying you have, I'm just saying if one has, those numbers like flash like neon lights, like those particular numbers are of critical importance in Kabbalistic thought. Twenty six. Sure, especially. for sure. I'm very interested. Oh, I, so I, I'll I'll send something to you. Mm -hmm. um, but it, obviously, it doesn't prove anything. But I think it's just fascinating to note that um, that science is showing to which some to something that some of us could regard as transcendent. Um, that talking about a twenty six dimensional universe, I understand that this is some expression of physicality mm -hmm. but in your if, in your way of thinking again both both as a, a person who has the soul of a musician and and the brain of a scientist mm -hmm. when we talk about multi-dimensionality can we be is that co-equal to talking about a spiritual reality or is it something different yeah i mean it's a very good question it depends for me if for me spirituality is um is um now for me and i've something i've I've spent a lot of my life, you know, I, I got into physics because of because of spiritual questions. Like I wanted to understand where did we come from? And I did. I just didn't want to only believe what the preacher was saying, because, right. you know, because of certain inconsistencies that I was seeing. Um, you know, it's really funny because um, I think it's the first time I'm actually saying this in public. I definitely do ascribe the little I've learned about um, about um, sort of like the little I've learned about um Judaism and also the more Vedic, you know, Vedic Eastern stuff, those things resonate, but to me in the following sense. So to me, I would, I would equate spirituality in my head with consciousness, with the mystery of consciousness. And if transcendence is about being able to somehow access or be more in tune um, with accessing those in that transcendental realm, and that be equating these other dimensions, that'll be very interesting. So you're not against it? Not at all. I'm very, I mean, I think to be a good scientist, I mean, I've taught, there's a picture back there. That's my, that's my hero in physics, Leon Cooper. Yeah. Um, that's a, a, a I um, had a watercolorist make a picture of him. Um, he was my first PhD advisor. Um, he won a Nobel Prize in physics. Fellow New Yorker like myself. I'm very proud of these things. Um, he went to the neighboring high school as my high school. But anyway, he was one of these people that was that like really influenced my my taste as a physicist, which was 
you know, don't claim arrogance here. Like, you know, you, we can learn things, we can know things, but keep an open mind, especially about things that we would love to understand in, in science, like consciousness, how does physical law apply to that? And I, so I keep a very open mind and I'm very open and interested to learn more. Seriously. So that's awesome. Um, I couldn't agree anymore. And, um, you know, somebody else who was very open-minded um, was John Coltrane. Oh, and, yeah. you know, you speak about him in your book. I know, I mean, I'm sure you can play, uh, you know, several dozen of, of his pieces. Um, he was known to be a particularly spiritual guy um, in, in a field that had a, has a lot of spiritual people, you know, in, of different flavors. Um, and, and I found a quote from him um, that I'd like to get your thoughts on. He said, he said, my music is the spiritual expression of what I am, my faith, my knowledge, my being. When you begin to see the possibilities of music, you desire to do something really good for people to help humanity free itself from its hangups. I want to speak to their souls. Is there a sense when you're playing, do you feel that you're communicating on a soul level to the audience, to, to yourself, to something quote unquote higher, um, is there a kind of communication that you experience like he does, you know, uh, that it's an expression that, like he says, of what I am? Um, it's becoming more and more that case, even if it's, um, hidden people, I would say at say an emotional level or, you know, one thing we, we, one element of music that I think is very important is rhythm. And like, just the way I have a friend, Will Calhoun, who's a great drummer and he talks, you know about rhythm, using rhythm as putting people in different states um, of trance maybe, or making them more receptive to, to things. Um, I do, I, I, of course, I totally agree with Coltrane. I would say I'm still a baby at, at that in terms of being able to manipulate my music to, to have such an effect. But I think for myself, whenever I play, there, there are times even when I play, I hit a certain sequence of notes It'll, I don't know what it does for other people, but it does something for me. And I, did, okay. I think one thing to get back to your question, uh, to throw a question back at you, it seems <laughs> that like this idea of the, the string of notes, they're not words necessarily, but right. there's a, there seems to be um, a hidden language or a hidden code that's somehow intrinsic to us as, as beings, as human beings, that, um, that it does, it is, is a, these strings of vibrations do um, communicate things, and but it's communicating at a more uh, soul or spiritual or con you know uh, subconscious level, you know emotional level. I, there really is something there. I, I totally agree. And yeah, it's universal. I I agree. Um, that's why I you know I I I teach people or I I talk to people about this a lot. I, I have an abiding interest in music. I've developed over the years a much deeper interest in science when I, when I wasn't a science guy when I was growing up, uh, but now I'm totally fascinated by it and I uh, think it has so much to say about our lives in so many important ways. Um, but it also seems like that it runs up against the limits from time to time. And this seems like it's one of them, you know, uh, trying, to, trying to articulate what music does to people um, in some kind of cogent manner, some kind of mathematical manner, seems like it's just barking up the wrong tree for me. Um, and and like you said, I, I, it's obvious some it's some kind of communication. Um, the question is what kind. And um, and for me, it's the communication of of consciousness. Let's call it, which is, which is sometimes called soul. Some kind, you know, has other words. I do not necessarily think this is a physical entity. Um, I know there's a, a, a lot of debate about that, and I don't think that everybody in the scientific community would be excited you know, to think of it that way. But still, I can't think of personally any other way to understand it, um, something that moves people so profoundly, so consistently, so, so often for so long, um, can't be boiled down to a, a mathematical formula, as beautiful as that formula might look when it's on a piece of paper. Um, but th that said, it, you know, you don't have to understand how it works to love it. 
you know, uh, the Rolling Stones say, I know it's only rock and roll, but I like it, you know, and on, in some sense, that's good enough. But for, for me and maybe for others, it's not quite enough. You know, I, I want to understand, like, why do we invest all this time and effort into this discipline? Uh, what's it for? Why are we why are we doing it? And um, and to me, that's the, one of the most fascinating areas of inquiry that, that in my life. Um, and I wish I had the uh, the mathematical and scientific ability to analyze it, which I don't. But I'm thankful for, for people like you who can do both. Um, and, you know, I know that you're a jazz musician and and I studied jazz uh, in school and jazz is an extremely special kind of music. It's got a certain kind of freedom. Um, the, there are so many expressions of it. I think it's uniquely American. Um, mm -hmm. There are so many wonderful facets of it. Um, however, it's interesting that it you know, used to be a very popular music, you know, back in the 40s, 50s, maybe a little bit later. And then, you know, rock and roll took over and then other kinds of music became the dominant genres. Mm -hmm. Do you like contemporary music? Um, do you relate to it in the same way? And, and just curious, you know, who you're into. Yeah. Thanks. I mean, yeah, I do. I like, I mean, I, I like it all. I mean, of, of course, you know, I love symphony music. I love string quartets. I love, um, hip hop. So I'm more old school hip hop, you know, more of the older stuff. Although I'm getting into some of the newer things that, um, you know, my daughter listens to, <laughs> my, she'll have a 13 year old daughter. Um, um, I, but in terms of, I mean, one of the things I'm really, I, I re, I'm really liking is like sort of the reinfusion of the Afro beat, like you know, people like Burna Boy and Wizkid, um, you know, that African sound now coming back into hip hop and coming back into R and B music. I love this. I love soul music of the '70s and '80s. You know, um, I love Madonna, old school Madonna especially. Um, yeah, so you know, I, I'm kind of like. I can find and one of the things as a jazz musician, um, some of the my favorite jazz musicians, they, they too like it all, you know. <laughs> so, right. And they can play you know, it all. And they can play it all. Exactly. Um, so I kind of see music as one whole continuum, um, you know, anything involving sound and using sound to kind of and the different sort of limbs of the musical universe that basically uh, function in different ways. So obviously I'm going to play me, I'm going to play some hip hop if I'm, it's time for me to bop my head and dance and get my body moving. Um, and I'm going to, you know, you know, if there's a carnival going on, we're going to play some soca music or some <laughs> reggae music, that kind of stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, I have a question for you um, because um, as a, as a musician, this is actually going to help me out here because what scale is in terms oh, of what you think about musical scale is home to you as a, as a rabbi in um, terms of a scale that sort of like evokes the most to you in terms of like your tradition and um, yeah I mean you know that you know, yeah sort of, the, the Jewish tradition is very into minor scales mine okay you know um, different different versions of minor scales you know um, but I, I personally like the whole tone scale. Uh, you, you mentioned you mentioned Debussy in in your book, um, and I relate to him uh, tremendously. I think um, that yeah. So so a he little bit more. A lot of jazz musicians, Debussy, big time, and vice versa. Miles Davis, right? Yeah, well, you know the story about kind of blue. Bill Evans basically told Miles, "Listen to some Debussy," and um, and boom. Kind of and that's probably why Kind of Blue was the album that got me launched into jazz and um, and one of the greatest jazz albums of all time, uh, recognized, you know, by everybody uh, as being such. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm on the same page, you know, that uh, uh, music that's well played is is for me, you know, whatever genre it comes from. And I, I relate to, to some more than others. And I relate very heavily to jazz um, in in a all of its forms, but especially in the fifties and sixties. But um, I have, I have time for one more question for you. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a deep one, I think, but uh, again, in your book, you talk about Dr. Christopher Isham. Yes. Uh, and he told you apparently at one time that there is a mystical side to doing physics. And you also note that Wolfgang Pauli and Carl Jung worked together, which I thought was fascinating. Um, 
for the record, is, is there a mystical side to physics? And if so, what is it? Well, I mean, at, at one level, there's, you know, you know, if I say that something that is not mystical is most mystical, you know, um, so in other words, just you know, a human being basically sitting on a planet thinking about the universe and coming up with theories, as Albert Einstein said, the most incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it's at all comprehensible. At one level, you can just say, well, there's nothing mystical about that, about a human being on some planet whirling around the sun or going around the galaxy. Somehow we have the capacity and the facility to actually construct theories that where we can actually understand things that are that we are not built to perceive directly four dimensional space time and time all this crazy stuff black holes i mean these are things of the human imagination i think that there is something mystical about that yes me too and so it has been a real pleasure for me to be able to speak to you. I, I sincerely thank you for your time and, and for all the great work that you're doing. Um, if I come to Providence sometime, can, I, can we jam together? I would love that. And what's your instrument? Piano. Oh, wow. Yeah, I'd love to do that. I'd love, I love playing um, duet with piano and sax. Um, as long as you can show me some chords and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. You'll show me something. I'll, uh, it would be great. It would be great. Okay. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you everyone for joining us on Beyond Belief. Please take a moment to subscribe to our YouTube channel and stay abreast of all the great stuff we have coming up. And once again, thank you all for being here. Take care.